The Clone Wars Season 4 Thoughts. So, spoilers for everything Star Wars leading up to and including this season in this video. And note, I may spoil the finale of this season when I talk about the premiere. So, yeah. The let's yeah, let's start with episode one. What a war. Sea people. This episode has a lot of aqua, man. The way the water move moves is very well animated. I love seeing droids made for fighting underwater with rotors at the bottom of their feet. Always love seeing more Kid Fisto. Very tense and suspenseful when Anakin temporarily loses his helmet and the two being attacked by the shark-like creature. So the good forces have blue lasers, the evil ones have red lasers. That does make it a lot easier to keep track of during big battles. And this episode does have those. I kind of love that the electronics, like holograms, just work underwater. Like, Star Wars has never been completely devoted to being realistic. This is still pretty far out. Surrender. Not so fast. Surrender. The Medusa things are very cool. I really appreciate the prince listens to counsel from Captain Akbar. This is before he became a meme. I mean, an admiral. It is extremely important for people in charge to listen to experts. That brings us to the next Gungan War. And the ship blows up right in front of them. I appreciate that Jar Jar insists that they move now and that the Gungans are cool when they come to support. I wish they didn't make Jar Jar annoying when he says he can't hear what's being said. <clears throat> and the episode ends with them being captured. Prisoners. A senator, two Jedi, and a Gungan. Shouldn't you be walking into a bar somewhere? This episode again shows torture is a tool of evil. I want to talk to your superior. Well, yeah, no one ever asks to talk to their inferior. Jar Jar helps. It's gross, but at least he is helping. Let my people go. I appreciate the prince appealing to the Quarren senator. He's super comfortable where he's sitting is the thing. I like the squid using his ink. We get some great undersea action. And the prince manages to take out Tamsin. Very cool. Smile, you son of a... And as king, he promises he will take good care. Like, take good care? Of Quarren as well as... Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> good. good thing we got that cleared up. And... <clears throat> Shadow Warrior. Jar Jar's less frustrating than he was in Season 1. I was wondering if they were going to belittle the Civil Rights Movement, but this is more like the genuine Sixth Riot since it's based on lies, not truth. Imagine slights, not actual ones. I really appreciate that Padme continues to be badass in action. Jar Jar does yet another pratfall, but he is effective when he po poses as Boss Leon, even talking with General Grievous, which he clearly is not super comfortable in that situation and General Tarpal warns Padme, General Grievous is here. There is a very serious risk that he might encounter Anakin before Revenge of the Sith, so take care. The droids are shut down, they fall like dominoes, which was kinda cute. Great action as the Gungans fight Grievous. I appreciate that it's different from the times he fights Jedi. And General Tarpals makes a heroic sacrifice to stop Grievous. I really wish it wasn't immediately undermined by the prisoner exchange. Unless maybe they're making the case that sometimes military on the ground will make gains in war and then will be undone by a decision made elsewhere, which is true, though that could be read as pro-Vietnam War, which is, which is very, very much not Star Wars. So over the course of Phantom Menace, I came to care about General Tarpal, so seeing him die here is genuinely affecting. You know, though the way that he gradually does come to accept Jar Jar in, in that movie. Dooku pronounces Rishalu as Rishlu, which I guess that is who he's supposed to be. Anakin is captured, comes extremely close to meeting Grievous. Make the right choice. The right stupid choice. And... 
mercy mission. The aliens are very cheery. I mean, they do legitimately think that things will soon get better, so they're focusing on that hope instead of how bad things are right now. They're already doing all they can to make things better. At this point, it doesn't matter if they're all so sad. So, yeah, very healthy attitude. Another quick... What's your problem? They're good games. 3PO gets into the hole, gets wood. Usually it's the other way around. We came here to help you. How? What do you mean, how? The ground shook. They were right by a hole. It's simple physics. I can't eat you. Forward, isn't she? At least buy him dinner first. I like the riddle. Oh my, I got the vapors. Aline, Aline, Aline. I'm begging you, please don't take my droids. Please don't take him just because you're annoyed. I guess the reason why these phones are... Uh, um, wow, I did not spell check my notes here. And they were voice typed. Let's see if I can recreate. Hmm. Oh, right, right. The the yeah, the drones dislike the two droids is that they're used to droids being the enemy, so maybe it's commenting on racism. COVID did lead to increased hate crimes against the Asians in America even though they had nothing to do with that. You know, what the Chinese government did in keeping secret that COVID had gotten out, you know, no Asian immigrant in America had anything to do with that. And yes, I realize COVID happened after this episode aired, but, you know, it's happened before, also. <clears throat> Which brings us into Nomad Droids. I quite like that these two episodes have R2 droids solving problems without overpowered Jedi or an endless supply of clones. I love the reveal that the aliens are actually tiny and yet shockingly effective. And they tie 3PO to the ground like Laputians would. Ding dong, Hisu is dead. 3PO abandons the people as they struggle with early democracy after killing the dictator and trespassing. Maybe that's supposed to be an allegory for Iraq. And then they do a Wizard of Oz thing. Pay no attention to the pit droid in the cave. If you want organics to push around, find your own. Is he a droid or a cat? And the pirates use droids in gladiatorial matches. I admire their restraint in not having a droid shout, Are you not entertained? Which would sound <coughs> very funny in that neutral droid voice that a lot of the separatist droids have. Are you not entertained? Incinerator? The cake is a lie? Wilf really doesn't want to hear 3PO explain what has happened to the two droids. And... Darkness on Umbara. Another case where the lasers for the two different sides are differently colored, making it easier to tell. I love the big creature with the sharp teeth and the spider droid and the ambush. Krell does not really listen, so, you know, a bad military officer, something that does happen in real life and needs to be dealt with. But he does dual wield dual lightsabers, which might be why people respect him. <coughs> Next episode, The General. <coughs> There's a mutiny brewing. The worm droid is really cool. Epic when it's destroyed. Love seeing a stealth mission. Their defenses are down. Send in the clones. He is the one who will never realize. And this was, you know, at this point I guessed Krell must secretly be working for the Separatists, which is confirmed two episodes later. And... Plan of Descent. They jammed our transmission. Strawberry? That is legitimately a clever alternate plan. And they accidentally blow up part of the hangar. No blown up hangars ever. Super impressive. Super intense, massive space battle. And impressive. They do manage to escape the explosion. Very intense. And Krell says they will be court-martialed. And... Carnage of Krell. 
some clones are just defective. In this episode, we get confirmation that he's evil, communicating to the audience that racism is evil. I mean, this literally is a, a paraphrase <clears throat> of stuff that racists say about, you know, people who aren't white. You are to be executed. How? Firing squad, probably. I hope you can live with yourself, since you now have less people to live with you. <clears throat> Everyone intentionally misses at the execution. I know this is not the first episode where it appears, but I would like to note I like the different looking hologram where it's like made up of those cubes instead of what we're used to for Star Wars holograms. It'll chew you up and spit you out. It's a man-eater. And we learn that Krell arranged for friendly fire. It's treason, then. We are at war, Anakin. So treason is okay. Amazing fights between Krell and the clones. They do almost manage to take him out with the Maneater, but instead get him with a stun. Krell is an agent of Count Dooku, son of Lord and Lady Poopy. He works for number two. And they execute Krell, and we're told... We, we were told earlier Palpatine was the one who put Krell in charge instead of Anakin. So, you know, with... Since, since we, the viewer, know what the characters in the show, you know, on the, on the, uh, Republican side, I guess, you know, yeah, do not know Palpatine is Sidious. And that brings us to Kidnapped. Anakin hates slavers, makes sense. I wish I could claim that wasn't a leftist thing, that it was just universally accepted, but here we are. Nobody forced Republicans to talk up slavery. The slaver planted explosives. Clever. Great fight between Obi-Wan and the slaver. I really love when the show has a fight where it seems like the good guy might lose instead of easily winning. Although we do, of course, know that Obi-Wan will survive. Sniper destroyers. Very cool. Very tense and suspenseful with the linked bombs. Even for OP Jedi... <clears throat> the jump Anakin and Ahsoka make onto the ship is ridiculous. I like the ending where the fight the squid-like being. Slavery will aid the rise of the Sith. Slaves of the Republic. Lars, stop it. What you're describing is illegal on most of the planet. And the would-be assassin slave would rather suicide than go back to processing. Obi-Wan is recognized, put on display. Very daring rescue attempt. I appreciate that it fails, because let's be honest, they really had the odds stacked against them. I greatly appreciate this episode underlining the things slavers do to control slaves. It's completely clear that this is a monstrous thing to do to other sentient beings. And I'd like to think that maybe some of the, you know, white kids being raised by conservative parents who watched this you know, were, yeah, went, went on to challenge the idea that, you know, black people, you know, that it was good to have black people as slaves. Let's see. The slavers kind of resemble humanoid cats, but they do take a lot more slaves than regular cats. Escape from Cadavo. More brutal slavery. You Jedi only make things worse. There are too many of you in the prequel trilogy, and you're too OP. Yas, Queen, I bring word. Bird. Bird is the word. As a cat, I'm sure she appreciates that. Anakin hops off the balcony onto the flying carpet. The reason that the Queen is attracted to Anakin is that she, as a queen and slaver, is surrounded by yes-men. He challenges her, and that's exciting. That's different. <coughs> And Dooku intends to execute the Jedi. I'm no Jedi. Badass. Ahsoka Tano saves the slaves from the electrified walls retracting floor. I greatly appreciate the detail that some of them are legitimately too weak at this point to make the jump. They have to be saved by Ahsoka Tano and the ARC Troopers. Another darn neutral people join us. Side. And... A friend in need is a friend indeed. Lux wants to kill Dooku, and the Death Watch abuse prisoners of war, underlying, underlining that 
Let's see, that's an evil thing to do as they're terrorists. And near the episode of, near the end of the episode, Vizsla says, You should not let the weak dictate what you're doing, what you're going to do, so they're fascists. Lux kisses Ahsoka Tano to cover for what they're doing, but she had no chance to consent, so that's pretty creepy. It is very sad and scary when R2 sees all the broken prisoner of war droids. I greatly appreciate that this episode makes you empathize with the droids. A lot of Americans have a chance to affect people that they think of as connected to something they hate. Haitians because of COVID, Muslims because of Al-Qaeda. They're not actually connected and should be treated with empathy. See, and Vizsla says they should kill all the evil, evil. All the villagers, truly evil. Very exciting when Ahsoka tries to save them all and she's caught with those retractable cables. And R2 managed to fix the prisoner of war droids and we get more reformed droids on the show. Excellent. Think about it. If they were not reformed, they would try to destroy R2 and kill Ahsoka. That's their original mission. I didn't miss. Badass. I can't go with you, Ahsoka. I can't go with someone watching. Deception. That sniper sure does miss a lot. Just goes to show you can't spell assassin without two asses, and he is ass first. We do find out he wasn't supposed to kill any of them, but he didn't know that. I appreciate they don't spend that much time before revealing that Obi-Wan is, of course, still alive, as we know from the movies set after this, which were released before it. And the Imperial March plays as Anakin is furious about Obi's death. What's your pleasure? The box that was always mine. We can't pull out. Our pull-out game is terrible. Obi-Wan poses as the Hardeen boy, who has a raging clue. Your clothes, give them to me. Now. So this is like the Star Wars version of Face Off or Mission Impossible. Not bad. Although apparently some people absolutely hate these episodes. I, I thought they were fine. Ben goes to the prison and follows the advice. The first day you the first day there, you find the biggest blark you can, and you make him your fnog. Love seeing more Cat Bane. Another baby boat uh, cameo. And the riot is cover for an escape. Clever. And we learn later that Boba escaped as well. This episode features clone looking clones looking like Imperial officers, showing the transition. I approve. Friends and enemies. It's Cad Bane, and he has a new hat. And he leaves Odin to the huts. Hey, Jedi killer, how was killing Jedi? Anakin, listen to my voice. I am your brother. We'll have to dance another time. So what you're saying is there's no time for the Lance Vance dance. And the box. What's in the box? The movie cube, apparently. One of the parts of the force sinks to the bottom. What a gas. And it turns out to escape the gas, you have to go down, not up. Very clever. Some very intense tests this episode. I used to kill parwans for a living. My living, not theirs. Very cool sniper test and not enough ammo. Bane doesn't mind killing Hardeen, but not like this. Enjoy the fight between Hardeen and the leader, and Dooku requests a fatality. Hardeen declines. Crisis on Naboo. Holographic disguise is very cool, and we were told in the episode before this one that one of these, one of these bounty hunters invented this thing, or some, something like that. Did not need to see so much cycling of the holographic disguises. I mean, I do have ADHD, so I appreciate that that was clearly tailored for someone like me. I think they went overboard. So Obi is in disguise and has a great sniper position. Very Agent 47. Double cross. Triple cross. Please don't kill Moral Oival. Your punishment will be much more severe. You will never again be allowed to refer to yourself in the third person. So the Splinter Cell double agent arc of the season comes to a close. And we learned Dooku was listening. Dooku, I'm not calling into question the strategic effectiveness of the maneuver, but I am afraid I have to inform you, you cannot have that many plates flying through the air without someone singing, be our guest. And that brings us to Massacre. 
you will no longer be ordered. Take a left here. Very intense ritual. Chorus, no, the audience only just met you. Zombie witches. Have I said recently how much I love the show? Because it's a lot. The defoliator is definitely Agent Orange, again criticizing the war crimes of the Vietnam War. And Dooku is attacked via effigy. I really love that the witches use their connection to nature more than physical force, since that's often thought of as more feminine, whereas physical force is considered masculine. So the show is communicating to the audience that women have strength and may be different from that of men, but they're not inferior. And when Mother uh, Talzin, the, the Mother Witch, dies, all the zombies do as well, so I guess they're like battle droids in that way. It's also cool to see zombies where it's like magic instead of, you know, a, some kind of science fiction explanation. So, you know, recently a lot of zombies is like a virus thing, which, you know, that's realistic, but this is the Star Wars universe. We're not here for realism. We're here for really out there concepts. <clears throat> Rather than realism. I'm, I'm not saying it's the only appeal of the Star Wars universe, galaxy. At the end of this episode, Ventress is on her own. That doesn't mean she's helpless. It means she'll have to change how she approaches problems. Communicating the value of there being strength in numbers, not meaning being on your own defines that you'll fail. And the next episode, Bounty. And a bounty hunter who harasses Ventress at, at the bar. After she makes it clear that she's not interested, he gets abusive, so she kills him. Great power fantasy. Baby Boba bosses Bosk. Really great fights on the sub tram. We get to see all the bounty hunter's abilities. Like, there's this one woman who's got, like, I mean, it kind of looks like vines on her body, and she can, like, whip them around other people, and she gets taken out because it gets whipped around another bounty hunter, and he gets shoved off. And, you know, since they're attached to her, very clever. I, I love when both sides in a fight are smart and use tactics. You know, that's a that's become a thing in, in more recent, but you know some of my favorite like eighties movies, the the bad guys don't use good tactics at all tactics at all. And it just gets you know, yeah. I prefer now that we're acknowledging that, you know, the other side might also have good tactics. Over my dead body. Your proposal is acceptable. Great, you broke the third rule. Never open the package and you develop sympathy for her. I would kind of love if they go on to have Ventress go through the transporter sequels as well. Ventress does not give the warlord Pluma instead of ransoming her to her own people. I have a future and I look forward to seeing it. brothers. For a while it seems like Warly is an AI companion. Annoying, but you know, that goes without saying for AI companions, I guess. Love the design of the fire breathers. I, I really love, you know, at, at one point, let's see, I think they like go and pick something up and chomp on it, but then like so stuff is being dumped from the air, so they just open their mouths and, and grab it. Just Yeah. I really love when Savage Opress gets out the dual-bladed saber. Darth Maul is indeed still alive, and he's got these, like, droid spider legs now. Very, very cool. And the Jedi realize Maul is still alive. And that brings us to the season finale, Revenge. We will survive, as long as we know how to love. And the ritual fixes them all. I really appreciate how dark some of this show gets. Like, that looked really, really, like, it looked extremely painful and got very, very dark and, and just, yeah. And, yeah, they slaughter kids to attract Jedi. And Obi-Wan goes and Ventress is going to, you know... Yeah, to go for, for Savage Press, and we get a two-on-one fight, which, you know, two, two 
let's see, yeah, it's Savage and Maul versus Obi-Wan. You know, the last time Obi-Wan and, and Maul fought, there were two Jedi versus one Sith, so it's a cool kind of reversal there. And then Venture shows up helping Obi, and we get some of the best saber action that I've seen in, in anything Star Wars, so that's really, really cool. And there's at least one point where the... Let's see, I think it's the... Yeah, uh, Ventress and Obi-Wan swap, you know, change places and, you know, yeah, change which one they're they're fighting against. And they do manage to escape and Savage and Mole almost get, you know, yanked into the void of outer space where they would, of course, float past a Xenodrone and a Queen. And, yeah, it ends, you know, counting on it. Very, very cool. Really excited for next season, which, you know, I will be starting either later today or tomorrow. So, t yeah, I, I get, it must have been really frustrating to wait. Like, let's see, I guess it's, it's months. It's been a while since I watched TV as just, you know, when it was airing. So, let's see, um, is there a, <clears throat> yes, um, <clears throat> my ranking of the overall, so, yeah, continues to be the overall season, the finale, and the season opener, Worst to best, season one, season two, season three, and season four. It just show keeps getting better and better. Really, really cool. And let's see. Okay, so I've got some critic quotes. Uh, let's see. I am not going to get into all of this. Let's see. Yeah, um, the the slave trade, you know, story. It's it's a decent little story, most notable for its glimpse into Anakin's hatred of slavery and the tragic irony that one day, very soon, he will be responsible for helping the Republic's future emperor enslave an entire galaxy while becoming a slave once again. This time to Palpatine. It doesn't resonate as much as it should, though, and the writer's hesitance to pull Anakin's trigger too tightly shows through. Let's see and. Um, yeah, a, a brief deviation was made for a two-parter involving R2-D2 and C-3PO, evoking the tone of the original trilogy. And... Uh, yeah, but the bulk of this season was spent on meteor arcs. And... Let's see... Yeah, uh, the, the, so yeah, the, the thing with Krell is tried and true, self-serving nutcase, cares more about his own glory, much more than the lives of his men, but it's spiced up by an undercurrent of prejudice against the clones, whom Krell sees as merely tools, not unlike the Separatist battle droids, undeserving of free will, bred to die on the front lines. And something I really appreciate was the, like, this is a, um, uh, what's it called? You know, it reminds me of during during World War One. The there was um you know you know if you if you look into that one you know it's it's insane how bad like there there was literally one of uh, one of the French generals. Not that the French were uniquely bad in this regard, but one of them said that machine gun bullets are no match for French courage. You know, that's not, I, I think I may have gotten a little of the quote wrong, but that's the basic gist of it, you know. And, yeah, like, you know, I don't know if he thought about it this way, but, you know, he wasn't the one going out there and getting gunned down. So, like, just a, an, a completely absurd number of people died because they were ordered to, like, walk or, or run or something, you know, but... They were ordered to attack machine gun nests in person. 
you know, it's not impossible to take out a machine gun nest, but you don't do it in person. You know, you use like a, you know, aerial bombing or a, or a, uh, what are they called? Ah, uh, crap. Yeah, you know, you you gotta you gotta bomb it. You can't run up to it. That's that's completely. So so yeah, you know, it it's. I th I think that might be what they were going for with with Krell. And yeah. Now some people feel the first six episodes do not particularly hold the viewers' interest. Honestly, I like them perfectly fine. Um, let's see. Yeah, like I legit, I really, really liked the the first two episodes. Yeah, I, I continue to love all of these episodes so far. I, I promise, the moment that one of them isn't quite up to to par, I will. You know, and I don't love all of them equally, but so far, I love all of them. Let's see, Prisoner, Shadow Man, yeah, yeah, I, I did really, really like those episodes. Now, let's see, yeah, and the, the this reviewer does go on to say, however, the rest of the season includes virtually non-stop compelling stories and action. Standout episodes are Carnage of Corel, Escape from Cadavo, The Box, Bounty, and Revenge. Yes, very true. And, yeah, this person says, the whole disguised Obi-Wan arc was just so bizarre that it's hard to accept as canon. I, it didn't really register that way to me. And, let's see. General Krell and Darth Maul storylines are my favorite storylines of the show so far. They add depth to the characters, give us more time with fan favorites, and sets up a potentially amazing season five. For the first time, I'm actually excited to continue watching the show. Yeah, to, to each their own. I've been excited from the very start. <clears throat> Yeah, this person says the first four episodes of this season are mediocre. But the the series quickly picks up. And Yeah, this uses Maul much better than he was in the Phantom Menace. And overall, this season is the best Star Wars storytelling since The Empire Strikes Back and should not be missed by any fans. Yeah, it's it's really, really solid. So, yeah. I think that is everything I had to say about this season. So, if you were right, as usual, you know, there's... there's I, I didn't comment on every single little thing. <clears throat> if you want... To, to know what I felt about specific things of this season, ask me in the comments, and I'll get back to you on it. It's, you know, as, as usual, the, the, you know, because of my back, the, the, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be talking about every single little thing about it. You know, honestly, like, if this was airing now, I would do an individual video per episode, like I do with the Mandalorian ones and such, you know, because there is a ton to talk about. Now, let's see, so, so yes, the, um, yeah, tomorrow will be Mandalorian Season 3 Episode 4, and I expect to make at least one more video after that this week, so I hope you stay tuned for that. If not, I hope I will catch you next week. May the force be with you.